Hello, my name is Debbie Nolan, and I'm with Henrico Recreation and Parks. And today, I'm going to be your host for a educational program, but a program that is going to be like adding an addition onto your home as we move forward. Because if you love fish and aquaculture or water gardens, this is going to be your opportunity to be able to know the in and out of doing it yourself. So this program will actually be in two parts. Uh, the first part will be on the pond in itself, and the second one will be on the fish. And then the overarching piece will be tips and tricks of what you can do, can't do, and what to look out for. And so with that, we'll move forward. Nothing's more beautiful than the sound of chimes, wind, and water. Peaceful, calming, and just what you need in your backyard. But it takes a lot of effort to get to this point. And with that in mind, it's a little manual labor and a little knowledge and a little education. Now, I myself have kept fish since I was 12 years old. I'm from Roanoke originally. I used to ride my bike to Wet Pets, the fish store, and I've kept fish ever since that time, tropicals. So I was an indoor aquarist. But I always longed to have koi, the Cadillac of the fish world. But koi are larger fish, and I never had the opportunity for that until I got older. So about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I had the opportunity and the perfect location next to my home to build a koi pond. And it's been a love affair ever since. Now, I don't want to represent myself as a, an expert, but as Papa says, I know what I like and I love what I know about it. So today we'll move forward and start with the basics. So the first basic is, is koi are beautiful fish. They have personality and they're a member of the carp family, just closely related to the goldfish as well. However, goldfish and koi are two entirely different types of fish. Now they can live for many, many years if you have the proper environment in your uh, pond as you move forward. And not only that, you'll have a little ecosystem in your lawn and on your property that you'll really enjoy. It'll draw birds and it will draw frogs and other creatures that will be never ending in your enjoyment and appreciation of that pond as you move forward. As I said earlier, the pond is an addition to your home. It adds to your landscape and the piece of beauty in your backyard. For this presentation, we're going to assume that you're going to build a brand new pond, 10 foot by 15 foot, and it's going to have a waterfall. All details that you'll be working out in advance as you move forward. Here's a couple of examples of ponds. One, the one on the bottom side has a really nice long waterfall. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, landscaping around the pond itself. Rocks are a key element as well as plantings uh, as you move forward once the pond's been constructed. Here you see a smaller pond. Uh, I'd say this pond, this was my original pond, and it had uh, about 1,500 gallons in it. A big difference from the 100 gallon tank I had inside of my house. So you can see the pond, are, the fish are very active, and if you notice particular fish in there, particularly that white one, you will see uh, them a little bit later in this presentation. So now as we work on moving forward on uh, talking about your water garden, your pond, and your koi, 
Now we're going to dispel some Koi myths. But before we get to that, remember ponds come in all sizes. Smaller ponds, you can often purchase them. If you're limited in your space, uh, you can purchase a kit, and they come as a preformed durable plastic container or an outer shell, which you can either have raised in your backyard or you can bury it. It can be above ground, and they're generally less expensive. They come with everything you need to be able to uh, have koi or goldfish. Usually in these ponds, you'll want to stick with goldfish because goldfish don't get as large as koi do. Debbie, we have a question from one of our viewers. Is there a better place to shop for your supplies for your pond? So a viewer has a question on if there's a better place uh, or where can you shop for supplies for your pond. Um, I'm a big believer in supporting local economy and our businesses, and here in Henrico, we have a really, really, really good supplier in uh, Fin and Feather and Lakeside Avenue. They have a huge pond department, and you really want to stock with your first fish, your first knowledge, working with people who are expert, and that is what they focus on, whether they be uh, tropical fish or uh, koi. And uh, you can buy just about everything that you need for your pond there. These kit ponds come with everything but your fish. Uh, but they can give you all manner of tips and tricks and expertise as you move forward. Um, and economically speaking, they're just as um, useful as going to a PetSmart or a, a uh, box store. So if you're in the Tri-City areas, you can go to uh, Boulevard Flowers because they specialize not just in flowers and landscaping, but also in uh, koi and ponds as well. So today we're going to look nine steps for to your dream pond. And so we'll go through each of these steps one by one. And of course, the last one doesn't really count because that's when you really enjoy what you have and how hard you work to get to that point. So nine steps to move forward. Nine easy steps with a lot of work behind them. So the first step is planning your koi pond. Now this is where you start to take your concept, your dream, and you put it into reality. You go out into your backyard, look at where you want to put this pond. Ideally, you want to be able to enjoy your pond from outside and inside your house so that you can hear the sounds of the water and uh, the other wildlife that it draws in. Uh, once you've settled on that uh, location, then you want to outline the design area with spray paint. Uh, that helps you visualize the actual size of the pond. It also helps you calculate the number and the amount of materials that you need for the specific dimensions and the layout of the pond. Now remember, we're talking about a 10 foot uh, by 15 foot pond. Now, just as a caveat, I always put this in here, just like when I started with computers, we always tend to buy uh, at one level and find out very shortly that we wish we had bought the computer stronger. Well, your first pond is the same way. Keep in mind that most people actually build uh, their first pond and then they think it's too small. So keep that in mind as you start to move forward. So af after you outline that pond on the uh, ground, that potential pond, let's say, then you can start to excavate it. And you can see where this has been spray painted around the edges and they've started to pull the sod away and to see what they actually have to work with. So find it and find the place and then start to make it a reality. Here's the hard work. A, a quick question from a viewer. Is it better to have your pond in full sun, full shade or both? Uh, great question has come through from a viewer. Is it better to have your pond in full sun, shade, or both? The reality of it is, is that you'd really like to have your pond so it got a little bit of all of that during the course of the day as the sun moves over the horizon line. Uh, generally having some trees in the areas uh, really helps with the shading. It has that added caveat of Trees drop their leaves in the fall, and a little later in this presentation, you'll see the ramifications of that. 
But knowing what you're in for um, and knowing that that's a potentiality, you can do things to mitigate leaves and that type of thing falling into your pond that also helps protect the pond from predators as well. So keep in mind that you do want some shades. These are cold-blooded creatures and their body temperature is regulated by the temperature of the water. Now, it's amazing to me that they can handle here in the Richmond area everything from freezing weather with snow, pond almost iced over, to uh, over 100 degree uh, temperatures. Uh, the secret to this is the depth of your pond. So when you're digging your pond out, the first thing that you want to do as you start to excavate the ground out is you want to go about 12 inches down to put your first plant shelf. It needs to be about 12 inches wide. Uh, your lowest point of your pond, as I mentioned a moment ago, to help with that temperature regulation is about five feet deep at least. And the rest of the pond should be at least two foot or 24 inches deep. And uh, that way you have levels of the pond for them to um, move into. In the uh, summer months, the Koi will be in the deepest part where it's the coolest, and in the winter months, they'll be in the shallow part, kind of laying there all together looking like colorful sardines <laughs> because they're cold. Uh, do, though, remember that as you start to dig and you start to excavate your pond, uh, 24 inches about the, is about the depth at which the majority of the tree roots are. So you may have some hard digging and expect that because like we said, if you have it in the uh, proximity of um, trees, you're gonna have tree roots there. So don't get too close to those trees so that they, uh, we don't damage their roots as we're putting the uh, pond in. So this step kind of happens simultaneously at the same time with the next step, but separately. So this shows you a really good example of the tiers of the pond. You can see the first level there looks to be about a foot wide. They've dropped down, and this is because koi will eat your plants, and so therefore you need to have them in planting baskets and the like. And so you can put these baskets on that shelf depending on the type of plant it is, um, how deep, if it can be in the actual water, that type of thing, and you can put them on that shelf and the koi can enjoy knocking it off the shelf for you <laughs> as it moves forward. So an example of uh, the pond, and here's another example, two more examples of the pond. And you can see that uh, the shelf is very defined. So as you move forward, um, you have to firm the ground up to make that shelf solid. So moving forward, just keep that in mind. You're laying the foundation here for the very next step. The next step is step three, and that's placing your pond equipment. So even before you put a liner in or anything else, you have to set your filters or your biological or mechanical uh, cleansing systems for the pond. So there's two filter types. There are biological and skimmers, and they help you clean the water. And if you choose correctly, and this is where going to Fin and Feather or um, your local uh, experts in the area, they can help you pick the right size of filter and skimmer to work with your pond. They, they will, and we'll have some uh, information a little later on that will help you with that too, but you need both. You need a biological filter, usually the, um, as well as a pond skimmer, which feeds the waterfall. So you do have to dig a trench from the um, skimmer itself, the box the skimmer's in, all the way around to feed into the box of the waterfall. It sounds complicated, it's really not. Um, it just takes some prior thought and planning as you move forward because everything you do at this stage makes the care and keeping of your pond much, 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 much simpler as you move forward. So keeping that in mind, we move to talking about the filtration needs again. So if you have a waterfall, you really need to have one because in a larger pond, you need the waterfall because it aerates the water and it allows the um, circulation of the water in the pond. So you really want to get a continuous flow under the water and then at the surface of the water. So within the waterfall, you place your pump. And so 
Uh, it usually takes a pretty strong pump to be able to circulate the water and run it through the waterfall because, as we mentioned a moment ago, it's got to travel a little bit of a distance to make its way to the waterfall to return to the pond and then work its way back to the skimmer again. So the filter, the skimmer has a filter in it too, but your biological filter you also set at the same time. Usually in an area uh, you want to space the things out so that they um, have plenty of space to work independently but collectively together. Uh, don't skimp on the money on this part because this is not, it's going to make your life easier. Because from personal experience, I can tell you that they will fail when you're getting ready to get in your car to go out of town. So therefore, you want to buy from a reliable dealer, uh, and they, they come with warranties and so forth. So it makes it way easier to get out of town in that case. So the last tip about installing a pond heater, of course, depends, again, going back on to uh, the reference about the temperature for the koi. Ideally, from 55 degrees to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, when it gets colder, uh, depending on how cold it is, you can have a floating pond filter as well. So that brings us to step four. We're moving right along here. So the construct of the pond has been built out. Now you have bought your filtration and you are ready now to lay your pond liner. Now, obviously the liner keeps the water in the pond and out of your yard. Uh, if you do this step incorrectly, you will constantly be trying to find where the water is leaking from. So make sure that you buy enough liner to fully extend past into the pond itself, up each level, and to extend past the edges of the pond, which you'll secure as you put it in uh, with rocks to help it settle. And uh, you want to be careful when you're laying uh, the liner in the pond that you um, are, are very, very careful because you can rip the liner and then that's a problem. Uh, of course, you probably could buy some of that stuff we see advertised on television that the guy puts, you know, in, in water, but you don't want to start that way. So buy the thicker millimeter uh, liner. It's a little more expensive, but... You pay for what you get, and it'll be very durable for you as you move forward. So some pictures of what we were just talking about. Now, the nice thing about having enough liner to extend past the edges of the pond is, is that when you put your rock down and when you start to landscape around the pond, the excess uh, liner also prevents weeds from coming up. So... If you have rock all around the edges and so forth, that helps you biologically. Uh, because once that pond is in place, no Roundup, no pesticides, nothing like that anywhere near that pond because it can seep and leach into your pond uh, to the detriment of your koi or your goldfish moving forward. So once you've got that liner in place, you want to start filling the pond. So here you can see the pond itself in the uh, upper picture, the water's starting to fill in. You can see that the gentleman uh, laying the um, liner there has his shoes off. So uh, that helps protect that liner. Also, when you lay the liner, you want to make sure that there are no rocks beneath it as well because eventually those rocks will work their way through as we go through the seasons of the year, as the um, dirt in your yard and so forth uh, expands and contracts from moisture. So keeping that in mind, we move on to step five. So you can see this is pretty simple so far. So you add rocks. Rocks are an important element of any koi pond. Uh, you get to rock it out, just like in uh, your favorite music. But that just means that you're covering it with the rocks to make it look more natural. Uh, most landscaping uh, companies um, there's a particularly, uh, several particularly good ones here in Henrico County and in the Tri-City areas where you can generally purchase your rocks. Generally, people use slate and then they use um, accent rocks to make it look more natural. You can buy that slate. Uh, I bought a whole flat of it. It was huge. Uh, but it used every single one of those rocks. Now, you do want to keep in mind 
uh, that you use the larger ones first around the area to help hold the ladder down, but you don't want to use decorative rocks. You don't want to use colored ones because once again, that color will leach into your pond. Uh, the, you want to make sure that the rocks that you may put in the bottom and in sides on the shelf for the plantings are smoother so the koi won't hurt themselves and so that uh, they don't cut holes in the liner itself. So one of the really neat things about koi is, is they're, very, they're very curious. They want to know what's going on in their surroundings and they will come all the way up out of the water, half of their body length to, to get at something if it's got their attention. So you do want to make sure that you don't have sharp or pointy rocks in that area so that uh, they don't have the potential of getting harmed in that point. So here you can see, um, you can see the shelving really well in this, uh, these ponds. Uh, and you can see that they're in uh, baskets on those shelves as well. And now the top pond, they haven't put the fish in yet. The bottom one there, the fish are working on trying to get at the plants. <laughs> so which brings us to step five, which is here you add any additions that you want to um, enhance your pond with. And you want to do it at this step because you can come back and do this later, but in the long run, now's the time when you want to do it. This is where you'd add ultraviolet lights that help control algae in the um, filter itself. Uh, both, sometimes both filters have uh, the ability for you to um, add the ultraviolet lights. You do take them out in the winter months to protect them and make them last longer, and that is the ultraviolet lights. You also add aerators at that time. The aerators help, again, to oxygenate the pond. Uh, the bigger your fish get, the more oxygen you need in the water. The hotter it gets, the more um, oxygen you need in your water. Um, a lot of times people like to add underwater LED lights. Uh, go for it, whatever suits your fancy. Now, I had lights. Lights, for me, were hard to maintain, so I keep mine natural with... Um, solar lights around the edges and so forth. An auto fuel line is really uh, handy because what happens is is that the, when the pond goes down to a certain level, uh, you, it will automatically fill, add enough to keep your um, filters and so forth from turning off. Most filters have an automatic turn off system when the water level gets too low, but the auto fill line helps to make sure that your pond stays filled to a certain level with water. So that's always very helpful too. So things to keep in mind. We have another question from a viewer. Do you just use regular tap water in your pond? A uh, question from our viewers and great question. What kind of water do you use in your pond? Well, considering that your pond may have uh, 1,500 gallons to uh, or 2,000 gallons or more, you just use regular water coming out of the hose in the back of um, your home. However, you treat that water chemically. And when you treat the water, uh, as you let the water flow in, you make sure that uh, uh, the uh, liner has settled down in place and you also start to add plants, but you also treat the water at this point because you need to get it in balance so that it prepares the water for your koi fish. Most of the time you put a, uh, it's very simple um, around this area, you want to have a barley type product that you put in the pond. It could be a flaked material or it could also be liquefied. And the easiest, um, there's, I'm gonna to speak to as what I usually use, Pond Perfect. It's uh, good for your fish, good for the pond. Uh, the uh, barley can be, as I said, liquid or uh, particulate, either one works. And uh, also you use a stress coat, just like you would for tropical fish when you put them in the aquarium. So you add those things to the water. Uh, koi fish also take a little bit of salt in the water. Uh, not a great deal, but you also uh, add that in periodically, especially if you had a lot of rain or you've had to replace a lot of water. So there's this little bit of chemistry involved once you get to this point, and then you wanna wait uh, three days to a week or more for it to balance out. And how do you know when it's balanced out? Well, you check the pH of the pond 
just like you would if you had a swimming pool. So knowing that uh, makes it, uh, you buy a little kit for it and you just have a little container, you uh, scoop water out of the pond from about a foot below the surface and then you have little um, bottles that test if the pH is high or if it's low or if the nitrates are high in the pond. And nitrates are extremely important with an outdoor pond because they can go out of whack, that's a technical term, uh, very easily. Uh, especially when you add fish, uh, you do need to pay special attention to that balance of the water as well. Now once you get in place, uh, get the water in place and it is balanced, you'll have fluctuations as it rains. If it rains a lot like it did over the past few weeks and it rained uh, quite a bit, uh, you'll have to go in and do a little bit of rebalancing because the pond itself will uh, start to foam and different things like that on the surface of the water from the waterfall. So here you can see that the clarity of this water is outstanding. And if you look in the um, lower picture, you can see that white koi that's in there. That particular one is about uh, 12 years old now. And uh, all of those fish in there are, pre are, are older, larger fish. And so um, you wanna make sure that the water quality is good so that your fish do live for a long time. Uh, that's the beauty of them. They start to become like family pets. And of course, the, you can see here that the, you, the rock extending down below the surface of the water onto the plant shelf, and the rock, the larger rock, holding the over top of the edges of the liner as well. So you can kind of see the finished areas and then the water up in the, uh, the waterfall itself up in the upper corner. And by using the smaller rocks with the waterfall, you can, uh, play with the flow of the water in the waterfall so that you get the sound that you want to have to the waterfall. And then we're looking at our plants. Well, pond lilies automatically come to mind. The plants fall in two categories, floating and submerged, uh, but also, and people usually don't give algae uh, the thought as a plant, but it is a huge plant source of food for the koi and generally you want to have a certain amount of, um, most uh, ponds will have a certain layer of uh, algae within the pond and that's totally normal. That indicates your pond has good pH level, that you've created a good ecosystem and that uh, everything will fr thrive from that, the plants and the koi. But I will tell you they love pond lilies. That was pond lilies before my fish ate them. <laughs> so a few more uh, views of pond lilies here. It's also quite nice to put uh, a planting in the filter basket of the waterfall. You can see they go nuts uh, from the constant sort of source of water and flowing around. You can see this, my pond itself was from early on because you can see the size of the fish there. They're very small. Uh, those pond lilies themselves, the uh, leaves are about five inches, I'd say, in circular uh, diameter. So a little bit more about the algae, three-fourths of an inch layer of that green algae helps them eat that. They love that. And it keeps them fed during the winters when really that's all they really want to eat is to nibble at that algae. Uh, you don't have to have ponds, but uh, you, you don't have to have plants in your pond but they not only beautify it, but it, uh, they do help consume the nitrates that build up naturally in the pond. So algae is a good thing. Debbie, we have another couple of questions from our viewers. You're getting lots of questions. All right. One is- <laughs> Questions are, coming. Questions coming. Are there rules or limitations on the size of the pond? Uh, are there rules or limitations on the size of the pond itself or the plants yeah, that we put in. Okay, there, there are no rules and no limitations on the size of the pond that you create in your backyard except for your pocketbook, I would say, <laughs> right off the top. Um, most people do start smaller and as they gain es uh, expertise, they move to a larger size. Um, 
depending on where you live, especially if you live in a, a more rural area and you have more space around your home, um, you probably no worries at all on how large you'd like to make your pond. I'd say if you lived in a development that was really, really close, you'd want to scale back on the size and um, usually there's not uh, local laws or um, needing a permit or that type of thing to put in a pond, but I'd say your um, space that you're working with back to your original con um, concept and design of the pond factors on if you're in suburbia or if you're in uh, a more of a rural area or a more open area as well. I think we have another question too. Times do you need to feed the koi fish? Oh, that's a great question. And uh, it really ties into when we move out of the pond and into the koi themselves. But the question is, how often do you feed the koi fish? Well, if you have that three-fourths of an inch layer of algae there in the pond, uh, they've got that as a constant source to pick at and to nibble on during the course of the day. The koi are going to eat every time you give them something. <laughs> they will eat. Uh, I feed mine once a day because that works best for me. It keeps them off the plants and it keeps them uh, manageable size. Um, we'll talk more about that in depth in a moment, uh, but uh, some people feed their fish twice a day. One thing to look out for is overfeeding your fish because if you overfeed them, Again, that uh, interferes with the um, balance, the pH balance, the chemical balance of your pond, and it can cause a rise in nitrates in your pond, which are detrimental to the fish and the other wildlife that may be there as well. So overfeeding, to prevent that, uh, you only feed the fish however much they can eat in under five minutes. And uh, depending on the time of the year, you use uh, the fish, uh, you want to have food that sinks to the bottom because they'll pink it, pick at that and pink at it, and then also food that floats on the top because that brings them to the surface where you can do an eye check on them every day to check on their health because you get to know them very well um, after you care for them every day. So more to come on that in a moment. Uh, then on step eight, look, Step eight's the last true step. That's the last manual labor step. It's the worst part of the project because now you have to clean everything back up, but it's so important because at this point, you put your project away, you landscape, you add in your flowers, you add statuary, put in birdhouses in the areas adjacent to your pond and feeders because the birds will come and fly to the edges of uh, the water at the waterfall and drink. The feeders attract the birds. You create a habitat, an ecosystem, and you'll really, really, really enhance your enjoyment of the pond. So right here is where you uh, take the base uh, part of the pond and turn it into your picturesque, peaceful pond. So you can see here, uh, bottom right, uh, that is the bottom picture, is where the, um, the original pond, see I built my original pond too small, so I came in and excavated it and made it larger. That's what the bottom pond looked like. You can actually see in the bottom picture the layer of algae that is on the liner, and that is normal and that is healthy to have in your pond. Uh, to the outside edge of the picture, you can see the skimmer a uh, uh, basket there as well. Also, if you plant an ornamental tree, almost everybody puts a Japanese maple nearby because of the koi being Japanese heritage. Uh, make sure you don't have it right on top of the pond area too, because once again, you have roots in the way. So you can see in the upper picture, we had not gotten the wheelbarrow out of place yet. <laughs> so still the finishing touches. Uh, you clean up and landscape your area and you add your fish in, and there you have it. So our finishing touches, when you do add the koi in, you've already added your pond, uh, pond plants, your aquatic plants. One thing to think about when you add your koi in, um, if you purchase koi from um, wherever you have gone to, uh, 
you, they're in a bag normally with some water in it. And so you float that bag on the pond surface for about 30 minutes so that the temperature in the bag water can acclimate to the same temperature of this pond water. So once you've gotten to that point and the two waters are similar, uh, you open up the bag, you add a cup of water into the bag from the pond over the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, once you've done that, you gently pour the fish into a net above a bucket and then put the fish into the uh, pond. Now, you don't want to add the water in the bag into your pond. Just uh, use it to water the flowers you landscaped with. And that's because you could bring in uh, parasites or um, other things detrimental to the chemistry of your pond. So just a rule of thumb, I know we all get anxious once we get that fish there that we want to get it in place and sit back and enjoy our pond. So listening to the pond, visualizing it, it just the whole ambiance of having this, the sound of the water. The fish get really rambunctious and jump up out of the water and breach the water like whales, some of them I do. So it's, uh, it's just brings such peace to your life. There's nothing beating, there's nothing that can beat sitting on your deck and watching the pond and sitting in the evening hours after you've had a hard day at work. Um, or you just are enjoying the afternoon and just watching them flourish. Uh, it's a year-round enjoyment. Uh, summer, moving into the fall, and here there are sticks across the pond. Ah, there's a garbage bag over top of the plants in the waterfall. Why might that be? <laughs> that would be because over top of those sticks is a net. You can't very well see it because it's black and it's the same color as the water. And again, like I mentioned earlier, you can see the tree trunks in the background. The tree trunks overhang the pond, and you can see leaves working their way into that area. So that netting does several things for you. It helps hold back that influx of leaves into your pond, but it also helps to keep predators from thinking that you're koi or a tasty treat. So when you know that, uh, generally you have to throw that net away at the end of each season and buy new netting. It's not very expensive, it's worth the money because it gets so filled with leaves and stuff, it's hard to pick it all out. So, um, and then over on the um, side of your picture, you can see a decoy that I have there laying it on its side and it's of a heron. Well, the herons love to stand there and look at your fish. The key to preventing a heron from thinking your uh, fish is the next dinner uh, that they're going to have, or sushi or whatever, uh, you gotta make sure that it's not a terrace drop down into your park, uh, into the pond from the edges of your water park. Because if they can walk down, they can spear those fish. If you keep the uh, sides of the pond kind of spread out, they mostly just admire. But remember, your pond, your pond is dark, the fish are brightly colored, uh, they look very um, appetizing to herons, to raccoons, to uh, e uh, hawks, and other things. Most of the time a hawk won't deal with them though because he doesn't have enough room to kind of skim, grab, and fly. So the netting helps you during the course of the winter as other food sources seem to dry up for some wildlife out there and they start looking at your brightly little um, menu items in the pond. So <laughs> it's uh, one of the things that you, uh, it's well worth the money and the time. And to keep the um, net from sagging into the water, I put those, um, those uh, pieces of sticks, uh, they're two by twos across the pond. So that just keeps it from dropping down in there because koi can also hook their fins into it and uh, you can get birds caught into it, uh, into the netting sometimes. So I've had a little bit of both things happen. So um, after the winter and after the, after the fall, uh, in the springtime when you get ready to um, open your pond back up, 
it's not always uh, roses and light and beautiful, and you have to do a bit of spring cleaning. So our next item is going to show us this. And you can see as these fish start to move around, and they're all excited because I'm standing there getting ready to feed them, and you can also see how large they've gotten, uh, they stir up all of that debris off the bottom of the pond. Usually twice a year you try to clean the uh, pond out throughout the summer, the water levels drop down and you add water to the pond. But um, generally speaking, you'll take a, the water level down, scoop out all of this muck, net, net it all out, and then refill the pond and then re-treat um, it with um, Pond Perfect, the chemicals, to get the balance back into place. But you can see they're right rambunctious there. They're waiting for their food. <laughs> so, uh, But like I said, it's not always sweetness in life. Once you get all of that stuff out of the pond, then you come back in and chemically treat it so that it's um, accurate. And that would be the pH balance of the pond. And so that it clears back up. If your pond is not clear, I didn't mention this earlier, but uh, you can add clarifiers in the water too to help clear it up as well. So I'm sorry the, I interrupted. I had another question from a viewer. How old sure. is your oldest fish? My oldest fish is 13 years old. And somebody had that question. Um, and it's not the white one that I keep referencing. If you look in this picture, it's the one down at the bottom of the picture that has the um, stripes along his back. I have three that are 13 years old. So the others fall kind of in uh, line with that. Uh, they're like children, you know. Um, I have 10 fish in my pond right now and they range from uh, four that were babies of these fish up to um, the three 13 year olds. And so winter. Winters around here, we don't usually um, we don't usually have this, but there's been several occasions that I have. Um, you can see this pond is open. What you have to make sure in the winter months for your koi is I mentioned that de-icer earlier or heater. Um, you need to have on the surface of your pond at least a space that is. Um, about a foot around, a circular space, almost as if you were going to go um, fishing in the winter and people cut out that circle in the ice. I've only had it get that iced one time and I have a floating de-icer that I had in there and you just pop it in there. But you need to keep at least a space a foot to two feet open so that oxygenation can continue to take place even though the fish aren't swimming around a lot the fish go almost into a hibernation state during the winter months. They, generally speaking, uh, from about October to about May, the fish don't eat. Uh, they hibernate during the winter months. Um, they, they um, kind of like a bear, only you can see them in the water. Now, they stir when you walk by and so forth, but they, uh, you don't have to feed them at that point. Uh, you use a different type of food for them in the winter, a wheat germ food, because it's much more uh, digestible for them, because you do not want to feed them too much at the same time as well. So generally, I do not feed in the winter months because um, they can, uh, it'd be like getting colic in uh, a dog or a or horse type situation. So just as beautiful in the winter months um, as in the summer. So that brings us to, in summary, on our pond, uh, koi keeping has been around for hundreds of years, and people still love koi, love having fish, goldfish, and koi both. And as we mentioned before, the size of your pond, where you put it, is depending on the amount of money you want to invest in it. Uh, the less expensive options are the kits. Uh, you can get small kit small pond kits as well, not just the prefab ones, but um, ones that range up to this 10 by 15 point uh, foot size. Uh, but they come with most of what you need. And then if you want to make one bigger, you go from there. So uh, you can, and I, 
didn't mention this earlier, but you can keep different species of fish together. Uh, Placostomus, most people may be familiar with because they help control the algae. You want that three-fourths of an inch of algae in there, but Placostomus are tropical fish. Now, you do not want to let these fish go in any kind of natural water because they are tropical and they're invasive. And uh, you, in your pond, they work to help keep the... Um, the environment clean, but once it gets good size, go back to your local um, fish store and see if you can't trade him off for some more koi. <laughs> they can get big fast. Also, you can put shabunkin goldfish. These happen to be shabunkins. In my pond, I have a, um, I had two. I have one right now um, that's bright orange. I got him because of the color. He's vivid, vivid, dark orange. So koi and uh, goldfish are very closely related. But if you look at these pictures, you can see at both sides of the fish's mouths, they do not have little tentacles kind of coming down on both sides. They're called barbells. Koi have those, and that's because they're bottom-eating fish. Um, the barbells, as they eat, their mouth is designed so that they can scoot the water around, the dirt around, the muck at the bottom, pull up that algae, um, pull up treats, um, and goldfish do not have those. Koi generally get significantly larger, up to three or four foot in size eventually. Goldfish don't get to that size. They're significantly smaller. Um, when you, people release goldfish oftentimes into municipal ponds and places like that, and you may be uh, fishing and somebody might hook a huge goldfish, and I've seen the, um, the smaller, uh, the more decorative goldfish, not the shabunkin, which look like regular koi, only way smaller. But it looked, uh, I've seen one that was the size of a football. It was so large. It was an ornamental fish that probably started an inch in size. So again, when your fish get larger, don't put them out into the outdoor environment. Uh, go back to your pet stores. Uh, we have in social media, we have all kinds of opportunities to network with other people here locally and in other areas where you can trade uh, your fish, whether you're trading in to purchase more or trading with other people, because the sideline of all of this is, is that koi are going to breed for you, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more after we say, how do we figure out how much water really is in my pond? Well, I'm not the world's best mathematician, but I thought that this shows you pretty clearly about how many gallons might your pond hold by looking at the dimensions of your pond? Now, most people's ponds are not square or rectangular, so you have to kind of take a guesstimate. But you multiply the length of the pond by the width of the pond by the height of the pond. And again, if you have a multi-depth pond, you have to kind of make an estimate. I figure somewhere in between the deepest part and the shallowest part to get your cubic foot size. Now remember our pond we were building here today was 10 foot by 15 point. So uh, you can see the uh, length by the width by uh, the height or the depth and you get 300 cubic feet. A cubic feet, a cubic foot holds about seven and a half gallons of water. Uh, so to find out how much 300 cubic feet is you multiply 300 by that 7.5 and you come up with approximately 2,000, a little under 2,300 gallons of water. So again, the width, the length by the width by the depth, and these are averages, to get your cubic feet of the pond. Then you multiply it by uh, the um, gallons, which is the cubic foot size. So you come up with that, you see right there, you come up. Now, why is that important? You need to know because the, the, um, the chemicals and the, uh, the add-ons that you use to help uh, balance the chemicals of the pond, you have to know how big your pond is, otherwise you can overdose it. Um, and, you know, generally you need to know that so that you know the pressure, how much pressure you need to have in your um, filtration system and um, how thick or how big you need your tubing to be. 
uh, for the aerators. So there's a, a myriad of reasons to know how much water is in your pond besides your water bill. <laughs> so with that thought, we move into the second point of our pond, uh, our presentation, the pond and now the fish. So looking at koi fish, most koi, and these are fun fish facts, so say that really fast two or three times, fun fish facts, koi fish facts. Koi have the potential to live over 200 years old. Um, as you can see, there was a legendary koi called Haneko that lived to be the oldest one that they've documented in history. He was hatched in 1751 and lived to be 226 years old when he passed away in 1977. That is amazing. So your fish can be very, very, very long lived. Um, I kind of like it to keeping um, birds. The larger the bird is, a parrot will live 30, 75 years. Koi are the same way, smaller fish don't necessarily live so long if the chemistries and so forth in the pond are not nurturing for them. But if you have the right environment, they can live 30 to 40 years with the proper care. Most of us, um, like I said, my, my oldest ones now are 13 years old and that's how old my pond is. So I anticipate them being around for quite some time. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that they run around three foot in size. That doesn't count the finnage if you have butterfly uh, koi. And all of omnivorous means is that they're vegetarians. They eat a lot of different foods. Um, I feed mine cabbage chopped up, uh, lettuce, watermelon. They like peas. And this is in addition to um, the manufactured food uh, that you feed them as well to make sure they're getting a balanced diet. Um, they love to eat. So again, you can see the size of these. You can see the size that tube that they're sitting next to is about two inches in width. So that kind of helps give you a little bit of um, an eyeball on comparisonly to see the size of the fish. All those bubbles behind it are an aerator. They like to move the aerator around. Um, the the uh, fish that you're seeing right here are the oldest fish. Two, uh, The first two are the first two of the oldest ones. Uh, the next one that flows there that's orange with the white head, that one is a male. There's that white fish again. Interesting thing about koi, another fun fact is, is that as koi age, their color patterns change. So they might start out looking pure white, and then as they age, you can see the white one there has a tinge of orange in the uh, tail and a yellow spot on their head. You can see that that one right uh, there has uh, white sides and a little bit of black on the top. That one was totally orange when I first got it. The one that just floated by with the black back um, only had a little strip of gray across his back. So their colors change as they age. And again, the color of the vibrancy of the color of the fish comes from their diet, just like people. It totally affects that bright orange little fish right there with the white edge on their tail. That's the Shabunkan uh, goldfish that I have in there as well. <clears throat> so goldfish were originally developed in China about a thousand years ago. However, uh, the first uh, koi were developed uh, in about 1820 for the first documented that we knew about Japanese carp. So a koi is actually a Japanese carp. So another, another few pictures of different colorations because that's part of the beauty and attractiveness of the fish. It's the colors, it's the size, it's their personalities. Uh, they, they gain distinct personalities, they're not bashful, they like to hop up out of the water to get it what they want to eat. Um, the hardest thing to do, though, is it's, and we'll talk about this, is there are certain natures to the colors. They have mythological um, characteristics assigned to these colors, and you'll want to have certain ones to have an auspicious, balanced uh, feng shui pond. 
So again, they're freshwater fish, they're domesticated, uh, closely related to goldfish. There's over 20 different kinds of color variants, type of scales, uh, long finned, standard finned. Uh, basically speaking, their body itself stays about the same. Uh, but they can have standard fins, which are the little short fins, and then they can be long finned, or we commonly call them uh, butterfly koi, or ghost, which is kind of a, it's kind of a cross in between the two. It may have uh, standard fins in the front of the um, fish, longer uh, tail uh, as well. But the Japanese really have it on us with, uh, like I said, 1820 moving forward. Uh, their knowledge and experience when it comes to breeding and gaining, uh, raising, breeding, raising uh, nishikigoi or Japanese carp, that's the word for it, uh, they will, uh, they know immediately the ones that are worth a couple hundred dollars as opposed to the ones that are worth $20. <laughs> and so, wide range of pocketbook there. Most of us will never buy a fish that costs $100,000. Now, an interesting place to do research is to go on eBay and look at the koi, uh, because you can see a wide range of prices there. But if you were in Japan and you asked to see someone's koi, they would take you to just see a common garden variety carp, because that's what they call, carp means, uh, the word for carp is koi. But the uh, ornamental uh, koi, what we know of as ornamental koi, uh, if you ask to see their water garden with the nishiki koi in it, then you would see what we know of as koi. So again, just a few more pictures of different, uh, different koi here, local ones. They're USA koi's here. So I've touched on some of these things. Um, just an overview, they recognize the hand that feeds them and they gather around. You saw from that first vehicle, they were uh, that video that we had a while back, they were really excited and coming. I whistle for my cart. They come running over to the same spot, I feed them, and <laughs> then they lose interest and go on after they've egged their fill. When I walk in from the car, they run over to the side to see what's going on. So when I whistle for them, they always come to the side. So they have personality. Um, they have their mouth wide open and kind of going open and close, open and close. I mentioned the barbells. That's how they eat off of the bottom. That helps uh, bring the food up to them. And I mentioned that you didn't feed them after the water temperature drops below 50 degrees. And that's generally... October, anywhere in between October, November, December. So um, as I mentioned, their digestive system slows down and you don't have to feed them. They, they eat what's right there in their environment to stay healthy. So some more shots of just koi in their natural environment. So I mentioned earlier that the um, koi can symbolize the fish itself in Japan symbolizes wealth, prosperity, love, success in careers, good fortune, and every variety, what we think of as a color variety, is associated with one of those values, whether it be love, prosperity, and you want to have one of those fish in your pond, your water garden, to gain that um, symbolization of that within your life. So as we already know, the koi come in a multitude of colors. Uh, they also can have a metallic screen to the uh, sheen itself to the um, scales, and that's a very desired thing. They sparkle in the sunlight. It's, uh, it looks like Jin Ren, but it's actually Jin Lin is how you pronounce that. And of course, they have different colored spots on their body. Um, as we mentioned, they, a blue koi can also uh, bring serenity, um, the asagi koi, the blue, red, gray colorings, positivity, and black koi, uh, not only is it a patriarchal symbolization, you know, it also brings you good luck. So um, even though the bottom of my pond is black, I have like a couple of black ones in there, and I don't get to see them except when they come up when whistled for. <laughs> 
So this is kind of like a little quick overview. You can see just from this picture that the body shape, these are all standard koi. You see they have little short fins. And you can see the variety of the different colorations of the pond, uh, the, of them that will show up in your pond. Now, the darker they are, if you've got a dark liner, uh, you won't see them as well until the sunlight hits you. And if your clarity of your chemistry is good, you can see them quite well. But the lighter ones show up really well. So when you think about that, uh, when you're choosing your fish for your pond, and these are all traditional, what they call traditional standard fins. So another view of those. I had a few different ones on that picture. Debbie, we have yes, a question from a viewer. They want to know how many fish you have and do you name them? <laughs> I have a question from a viewer that wants to know how many fish that I have and are they named? Uh, I have, right now I have 10 fish. Um, I'm getting ready to add a couple more. My pond went from uh, 1,500 gallons to 4,500 gallons. <laughs> so I'm getting ready to add a few fish to the mix. Plus my fish have just gone through the spawning season so I expect to see some babies in there. Each year I've gathered a few additional uh, koi just from the interbreeding of my koi with each other. And uh, no, I haven't named them. Uh, we, <laughs> no particular reason I call them that fish or the yellow one or the white one or, or the, the, th the big three, you know, uh, but I never have named them. So uh, that's something to think about, but I don't know. I just never have. And so then we get into uh, the variety colors themselves. Basically, the um, koi come with in two uh, different types of color patterns, a white background with the colors on top or a black background with the colors on top. So I'm gonna apologize in advance if I uh, butcher these names because my Southwest Virginia accent uh, doesn't always agree with Japanese, uh, but I'm gonna do my best. Uh, the, the fish with the, just the orange and white on it uh, is called a kuhaku. And we see this coloration quite often. The fish is all white and it'll have orange on it. Then uh, a tanku sake, or a sake for short, uh, it usually adds to the white and the orange those black spots. They're very popular, that coloration is. And it shows up. Now, one thing to think about when you look at these pictures, they're showing the fish, just like on the two diagrams before, from above. So thinking back to where uh, the J Chinese have kept goldfish since over a thousand years, and since the 1800s, uh, the Japanese have kept koi, well, they didn't have the ability or enclosures to see these fish from the side, so you would always see them depicted from above because they would keep them in bowls um, and uh, d deep bowls and dishes uh, because they were highly treasured members of the Japanese family because, once again, they had that symbolic significance to them as well. Kind of like how cats were re revered in ancient Egypt. You know, you always had one around because they were highly re revered in that, uh, revered in that uh, society. So same way with the koi. So here on this fish, you see now it has red, white, and black. Now this particular one has black base, orange on top, spots. A showa sanchoka, showa sanchoka. And then the opposite one, this one with the orange dot on their head and the rest of the body white, is called a tan, tanto, tanto. And they're very popular because the red crown crane in Japan is a very revered, uh, bird and you'll see it often in their embroidery of um, their um, uh, materials um, and fabrics uh, and you often see the fish also depicted from above. So Tantu and Showa Sankoyu. So these fish, they have black base and you can see that the white is layered on top 
And then the opposite one has orange, deep orange, and uh, almost a red on this one. These types of fish with the black background start kind of dusky looking. And if you remember back, me saying that as the fish age, their colors change and get brighter sometimes, or more of it, or less of it, patterning wise. And so this particular style of fish, um, this particular variety of fish does exactly that. Now these fish, uh, again, the one uh, that's yellow and black is also the black background. It's in the same family as the last two. Uh, this one's very rare because the golden color over the black, you just don't see that one as often. Um, the one with the patterning that looks like a pine cone on its back. These are very popular. It's called an asagi. Uh, I have a couple of those that have that patterning. One of mine is totally black with orange outlines on the patterning. Uh, so very, very, very beautiful, um, lace, lacy looking in their uh, design. Here we have a scaleless fish. Uh, that's a shoshi, shoshi. Uh, it has the net pattern, but if you see those dark objects running along its spine and then it's a white background fish and then has the orange, the only scales that fish has, the show C has, uh, are those dark scales right on its back. So they're very popular. Uh, they run along the dorsal line of the fish. And then again, the matzba, the white fish with pine cone design on it. Uh, this is a, a G matzba because it has metallic um, fins, uh, scales, metallic scales on it as well. Remember that was G-Re when they have the metallic scales. And then these uh, two fish are two examples of the Ogon uh, fish. They have standard fins. One is we call platinum, uh, and the other one's a golden metallic color. The Pratichinia, Ogon Pratichinia, and the Ogon Yamabuki. I had, a, I had one of the Ogon Yamabukis. It got hurt by a crane when the pond was uh, shallower. I mean, not a crane, but a uh, long-billed uh, heron. So as we move to, through these, we see other variations with orange, black, and so forth. All of these are, you can go to the stores and see many of them in shipments. At Fin and Feather that I mentioned earlier, they have big tubs on the pond side where they bring in different sized fish. So you can buy into your fish purchase based on, again, how much money you want to spend. The one thing you really want to make sure of with your pond is, is that you don't overcrowd it. So it's better to start with a smaller number of fish and then add on periodically. So here you have a white koi with orange patterns. This is a kushi, shia, uh, right there. And then a ben kumandandi. Uh, and it's added white, orange, and black. So again, the patterns change through their lifespan. So you can see there's a lot of variety there. Goshi and goromo fish, very popular. Different color patterns. Goshi is five colors. Goromo has got edging again on the scales. Good, and other examples of white base. These are scaleless, and you can see the scales on their back. The rest of the fish is uh, scaleless, smooth to the touch. Good, here you can start to see the scales on this one as opposed to the last one. You can see that very, very, very well. So some koi myths that I want to talk about for a second is, is that Koi, the first myth is, is that koi are expensive. Well, sure, you can buy fish for thousands of dollars and even for $100,000 on the seriously, uh, the serious readers and collectors in Japan and so forth. But you can spend $20 and up for a fish uh, depending on where you purchase it. And again, you don't need many 
to start with because they do breed like crazy once they get a little size on them. They do have to develop size before you start having babies in the fish, with the fish. So your pocketbook's the answer there, start small. Uh, don't get ambitious and buy expensive ones until you've gained a little experience working with them. Uh, the second myth is your koi pond needs to be large. Uh, smaller ponds, again, does not have to be large. Smaller ponds, you just take care not to overcrowd it. Uh, you, uh, sometimes a general rule of thumb is an inch of a fish, and one inch of fish per 10 gallons of water. Yeah, that's, that's true, but uh, really, the whole thing to keep in mind is, is start with a smaller number. Remember, you want to keep the nitrates down. Uh, nitrates are formed by the, um, the w waste from the fish and the plants and pieces of bits of stuff that falls into your pond and creates sludge at the bottom. And so you always want to keep that down. That's what you clean out in the spring and the fall, the, fall, the sludge. <laughs> and then our third myth is koi only grow to a certain size based on how large your pond is. Not true. The koi will continue to grow. I think I read a stat that they would grow uh, 23 centimeters a month if you kept feeding them. Uh, I don't recommend feeding them more than once a day, but when they're younger, you do feed them more. Uh, use smaller food, diameter-wise food, and as they get older, you buy larger uh, size food. So even their food comes sized as well. But the, the koi, if your water quality is good, if your uh, koi are doing well and healthy, they're going to continue to grow and they will continue every year to get larger and larger. And I can tell you that mine have done that. I am not surprised that yours won't either. Uh, be restricted by the side of your pond. They're mostly restricted by how much you feed them and the quality, the water quality of your pond. So hopefully today you've gotten a little bit of an overview of how to start in the koi world, how to build your own peaceful pond. The koi are just amazing to work with. They're, they have a lot of personality. Um, they're wonderful to just have them there in the pond, moving around, watching what they do throughout the course of the day. Uh, they have a whole systematic thing. They jump out of the water when they get excited. They jump out of the water to go for a bug flying above. So when you move from there, uh, you've got the sound of the water. You've got all of the things that make the pond such a significant add on to your landscape to your home and to your peace of mind because there isn't much more too successful, too wonderful in your life to be able to sit out there and just enjoy the calming effect of the fish moving in the pond. This particular video was taken at dusk and that's why it looks almost black and white. But you can see the fish moving around, but most of all, you can hear the frogs, you hear the water, and you hear the ambiance here. Hopefully this has set you on the direction to be able to start your own peaceful koi pond. Feel free to contact us with more uh, questions. I'm available to answer them at any time. Um, Experience is the best teacher, but I know what I like and I love what I like. You will too. And when we keep that in mind, remember, if you've enjoyed this presentation, please stay in touch, follow us in social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all of our, and our virtual page itself, which you'll see the address for as we move to the finish of our presentation. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here and enjoy your peaceful pond. <laughs>